I want to talk to you both about uh, interesting developments in, in spreads in some of these ETFs. We've heard some bond funds, uh, LQD was one example, recently traded at a uh, much wider discount to their net asset value than usual. Some are blaming ETFs. But Dave, you've pointed out that what seems to be broken here, if broken is the right word to use, is the bond pricing services. Can you explain what you mean and address this whole question? Sure. At the simplest level, if you're a bond indexer, say um, an, an, a market, an IDC, a Bloomberg, you're putting that index out, you have bonds in your membership in that index that may not have traded for days or weeks, particularly less liquid securities like high yields, high yield munis. But at the end of the day, you still have to price that. You still have to put in net asset value out there as a mutual fund or as an ETF. The way you do that for something that hasn't traded is you have to have some kind of a model. And traditionally, what that model does is look at the last time that bond traded, see what similar things have done, and then adjust that untraded price to come up with some estimate of fair value. That sounds fine. The problem is those models do not react very quickly. They tend to be lagged by days, if not longer. So when you have a hyper liquid market with a hyper volatile movement in price, like we've seen across the, uh, the entire fixed income market, those services lag. So what happens is the NAV stays stuck at an artificially high level, not because those bonds are worth that much, but because the pricing service hasn't recognized the new reality. That new reality is what bonds are trading or trading well underneath it. So you're creating this artificial so gap. Go ahead. So your point, Dave, it, your point is it's the ETF guys, the guys who are buying the stuff, they're getting the pricing right because they're reacting instantaneously the way they feel the market should be. And it's the bond pricing that that's lagging. You, 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 my point here is that the ETF haters are out there saying, aha, you see, there's a couple of these bond funds and they're pricing it. The ETFs are pricing at discounts, the net asset value. What's that all about? That must mean the ETF model is broken. Your point is it's the guys buying this who've been right all along and the market's slower. And, and right it's actually going to get, I think it's going to get worse for the mutual fund industry. We've already seen this outside the United States. States. We had 30 open-ended bond funds in Sweden close last week because of this exact issue, that they could no longer guarantee that those prices yeah. were good, that they were real. We're going to start seeing bond mutual funds in the United States have to close for redemptions because what happens is if you get out at those ex exaggerated prices, that forces the mutual fund to sell, to make cash, to meet those redemptions, hurting the leftover shareholders and forcing the NAV eventually down towards fair value. But there's a real discrepancy yeah, right. here between the instantaneous bright discovery of the ETF and the lagged NAV of a mutual fund. But Todd, isn't this at heart still just a buyer seller disagreement on the prices, right? I mean, Dave says the buyers are right. I tend to think uh, that that's probably the right way to look at this. But it, it's still there. There's an issue here that there's been some discrepancy between the net asset value and the ETF prices. How does the market address this during times of stress? Is there an answer other than just you guys have got to move faster on your bond pricing? Well, yes, I think that's probably a solution to it. But I think to your core question of the buyer versus the seller meeting, that's what's happening at the ETF level. The buyer and the seller are agreeing on a price. That's what we're seeing for the price of the ETF like LQD or MUB or some of these other pro liquid right. products, whereas the net asset value is based on the buyer and the seller of the bonds. And when there's less activity there, there's going to be a lag behind that. So I agree. I think the ETF is more right. I don't think either the ETF or the mutual fund that's based on that asset value is correct because this is moving so quickly. And the bond market just is not as liquid. ETFs make it more right. liquid, so but it's not, they don't make it – they don't provide instant liquidity. Yeah. So, Dave, is there an answer to this other than tell the bond guys you got to you got to sell your stuff faster and get faster pricing? It, what's the solution here? Because it seems stupid to blame ETFs for this. And yet that's what some people are trying to do. Well, the, this does play itself out naturally, right? Time eventually cures all wounds. And we've seen this. The net yeah. asset values on these bond ETFs and mutual funds are starting to plummet down to the levels we would expect them to be at based on where 
prices have actually been in the market. So time does solve this problem, but fundamentally what's broken here is the valuation of untraded assets. And that's happening at the NAV level in both ETFs and in mutual funds. Right. That's not gonna get fixed overnight. That's gonna require major structural changes to how our credit markets work. I don't see that happening in the short term. Right. So you're, the, the point here, I'm trying to lead you on here, the point is that it, th this is a commentary on, on the st structural set of the bond market, not whether the ETF market is part of the problem. The ETF market exactly. is the one trying to figure out th what the real prices are, and they've gotten things remarkably right. I keep commenting on how well they did estimating the Chinese stock market when the, when the market was closed for more than a week. They seemed, the ETF seemed to accurately price where the, the stuff was really going to be trading. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And that's what we're starting to see now. Okay. We're starting to see those things come together. Okay. Let me move. On. Let me move on here. One of the things that's odd we've seen recently is uh, bond prices moving down across the board recently. So corporates down, high yield down and muni bonds. Now, we don't normally talk about muni bonds. The big one is MUB. There's not a lot of uh, ETF activity, but MUB is pretty big here. Um, I, and people kept asking me about this. And of course, we had to remind everyone it's these municipal bonds that pay for the transit systems and that pay for the convention centers in, in all of these cities. Um, Dave, do you have any uh, observations on this? The minute we, they announced some support for muni bonds uh, from the Fed, uh, it started to stabilize a little bit. But it is a very good reminder of what these things do out there. Nobody quite ever thinks about, you know, uh, why would a convention center ever be in any trouble or anything like that necessarily on a very right. broad level. But we saw that concern. Well, and a lot of times these are revenue bonds. Like a lot of times they are directly tied to the performance of a municipal facility like a convention center, like a toll highway, something like that. And all of those things are going to get hurt just as much as Marriott and Boeing are going to get hurt here. The, uh, unfortunately, most municipalities don't have the backdrop of, say, corporate equity where they can issue fire sale secondaries and things like that to rebuild their businesses. So I, I think it's obvious that there's an increased chance of default in the average muni just as there's an increased you know, chance of default in some energy bond, right? Those are going to be pressured yeah. as we go through the bottom of this recovery and figure out what the real damage is. So the sell-off in munis makes as much sense to me as it does the sell-off in high-yield yeah. energy debt. But I, and I would add yeah, to that, does. if I could, uh, Bob, sorry, if I could, if I could add quickly to that, that municipal bonds tend to be more mom-and-pop individual investors. They're bought and held, so they t tend to not trade so Whereas we've certainly seen pressure on the revenue side of this, there's just less trading volume for these individual bonds inside MUB or some of their peers. And so it goes back to the same problem we talked about earlier. If there's no buyers of the bonds, it's hard to price those or it's hard to price the bond ETF accurately. Right. Well, if you if you think it's a right, if, if you think we're somewhere near a bottom, uh, the yields are certainly a lot better than they were a month ago. That's for sure.